Uh, thanks so much. Welcome back to uh, the course of War and the Humanities, which is sponsored by the Center for the Humanities and the Public Sphere. And I'd like to thank again Barbara Menel for organizing a group of really solid presenters and taking us into some really interesting ways of looking at war from a humanities perspective. And today we're going to be focusing on uh, war and monuments. And this uh, struck a, a, it made me feel like this was quite important. Several years ago, I was involved with a group that was fighting to remove Old Joe, the, the Confederate statue in downtown, which uh, successful, was a successful effort, but um, among many that went around uh, the US. And I think that uh, Sean, our speaker, will uh, give us some real insight into why monuments are so important in uh, commemorating war and what it means to us. Sean Adams is the Hyatt and C.C. Brown Professor of History at the University of Florida, where he teaches classes on the history of American capitalism and global energy. He's the author of, or editor of several books and articles dealing with the coal industry and is currently working on a multi-century study of the economic valuing of land in Spotsylvania County, Virginia. Professor Adams, take it away. Okay, thank you. Um, and thanks for having me. Uh, Barbara is a good friend and um, she asked me to do this and I was very excited to do it. Um, so uh, what I am gonna talk about today, it sounds very fancy to say multi-century study, but essentially um, it's uh, a... You got me? Okay. Uh, that is on Spotsylvania County, Virginia. Too loud, okay. Am I good? Okay. Uh, the, the, the project that I'm gonna use as a kind of center to talk about war and monuments, because there's no way I could really deal with the entire subject, is to focus and bore down a little bit um, on monuments during the American Civil War. And um, in particular, drawing on the research that I'm doing for this project. Um, essentially, I was asked by the National Park Service to do something, and I'm trying to spin it into a larger book, looking at um, Spotsylvania County uh, from the colonial period to the modern period. Um, and the reason why Spotsylvania County is so interesting in terms of this talk is there were four major battles that occurred within about a 10 or 15 mile radius. You had the Battle of Fredericksburg in 1862. You had the Battle of Chancellorsville in 1863. Uh, and the battles of Wilderness and Spotsylvania Camp Courthouse in 1864. Um, and so that landscape now uh, is uh, going through a process, a continuing process of being remembered uh, as a significant site of sacrifice. But as I wanna make the point today, um, war monuments might seem pretty straightforward, right? They are supposed to commemorate people that sacrificed a great deal, uh, for a cause. Uh, some of them even died, and that's what we're memorializing. But along the way, of course, they get a great deal of political meaning and can become uh, very significant flashpoints. As Rick alluded to, uh, right here in Gainesville, we had a Confederate memorial uh, that was somewhat uh, controversial uh, and has created a little bit of animosity uh, within the community. So these kinds of monuments and remembering are never without any kind of um, political um, consequences. So if I can get my PowerPoint up here. So as I said, I'm gonna focus really on, on the Civil War. It is the one that, that produced far and away the most monuments in American history. In fact, I can tell you this because I've worked closely with the folks um, at the National Park Service at, at the, the park that I work with is Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania National Military Park, um, which commemorates those four battles I mentioned. And they said actually that French officials had been contacting them uh, to work with them on World War I uh, monuments and memorials because uh, over, I guess, in France, they 
don't have a tradition like we do in the United States of having these kind of national military parks uh, that are meant to both educate but also commemorate um, a, 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 a battle. And so they're actually going to draw on our experience uh, in commemorating the Civil War uh, here in the United States. Okay, so uh, you guys know all about the Civil War, right? It was in all the papers. It was, uh, you know, it was a four-year conflict in the 1860s. And uh, just to give you a sense of, you know, what the landscape looked like in, for example, Spotsylvania County, these battlefield parks, these sites of commemoration, uh, in the immediate aftermath of battle is they were wastelands. Um, you know, this is the Wilderness Battlefield in 1864. Um, you can see there, there's a human skeleton. Um, the important thing to remember is if, if you go to these monuments, these, these national parks now, they're parks, right? They, they, they have beautiful old trees. They have nice, very accessible paths. Um, the National Park Service, as I was told again and again by the park rangers, they're not in the business of cutting down trees to make it look like it did during the Civil War. Uh, they're in the business of preserving nature and, uh, you know, they're also the, the history of, of the area. But if you go back and think about what the landscape would have looked like in the aftermath, say, of four major battles, um, there were not only human remains, but there were also canteens, there were bayonets, um, there were discarded kind of remnants, um, you know, soldiers were over this landscape and they were like locusts kind of consuming everything that they had. So the first kind of matter of commemoration of monuments in the Civil War sense, and in most, I think, uh, wars, is uh, simply taking care of and uh, commemorating the, the, the dead that fell in battle. And uh, the way that the United States did it was through the National Military Cemetery System. Um, now, the dates that I'm gonna have on here are not the dates that the pictures are taken, obviously. Um, it's the dates in which they're created. So Fredericksburg National Cemetery is created in 1864, um, and it is part of a wave of national military cemeteries set up by the United States um, because in battles like Fredericksburg and Chancellorsville and Wilderness, uh, in the immediate aftermath, burial details would usually go and just bury bodies close to where they lay, often in mass graves, often unidentified. And so, as you can imagine, families and citizens did not particularly like this idea. And so the federal government came up with a way in, in, in Fredericksburg, they set up this national military cemetery. Now, as you can Notice here, it's not a very elaborate monument. Um, now they have all these terraced uh, areas. These are all basically mass graves uh, with very simple markers that just give locations. Uh, as you'll see here, the first monuments are very, very rudimentary. There's a stage, I think, of monument creation. Uh, and as we get farther from a conflict, uh, the monuments usually become a lot more elaborate and frankly, I think, a lot more political, a lot more, uh, they have a lot more of an argument that they wanna make. But the first kind of stage of this is to simply kind of mark uh, where, where people are laying. And it, uh, this is actually from Memorial Day. I was up there uh, for Memorial Day. Um, they do a nice ceremony. Um, you know, the origins of Memorial Day uh, actually has to do with these monuments. It was called Decoration Day. And it was a day in which uh, relatives and friends would go decorate uh, a Union soldier's grave. And then, of course, because the South wanted to emulate that. They had Confederate Decoration Day and then eventually got rolled into Memorial Day, a more kind of general um, holiday about veterans. And so it's, it's an impressive, it's, it's a bit humbling uh, landscape to see. Um, as I mentioned, I went on Memorial Day, so these are actually pictures that I took. Um, it's, it's Decoration Day, but uh, what they do is they decorate with small uh, the, you know, US flags. And then um, the, the markers, as I mentioned, are quite humble. Now this is uh, plot 3182, um, and the number 11 means that there are actually 11 soldiers buried there, um, probably unknown. Um, they are in the process through forensics and through so forth. They'll, often what they'll have are simple um, initials and maybe a unit, um, and they'll tie that to, to an area, but they're still, it's, it's an ongoing process. They have volunteers working for the Park Service trying to identify these folks. Um, neither the Union nor the Confederate Army in the Civil War had a kind of systematic way of identifying individuals. They didn't have dog tags. Uh, some, some folks did stuff themselves. They would write their name and address 
um, on a piece of paper and often pin it to their back in case they died in battle, their body could be identified. That's kind of gruesome, but that's what the Civil War had become. And um, this national uh, uh, cemetery is a way to commemorate that. Now, of course, what's interesting is, uh, you know, I mentioned that these monuments are often rudimentary and they become more political over time. With the Civil War, it was pretty political from the beginning. Um, Confederate soldiers were not allowed to be buried in Fredericksburg National Cemetery. And so the Confederate soldiers, um, and again, these would be hastily marked temporary graves, were simply left out in the field. And so residents of uh, Fredericksburg, because it's in Virginia, um, in 1867, that's what this date is, the 1870s when they actually really started uh, burying Confederate soldiers there, uh, did their own version. Now it's private, it wasn't funded by the federal government, and the monuments there are very similar. Um, this, uh, I believe I took this picture. Uh, I did not go on, they had a, a, a decoration day service for the Confederate uh, folks as well, where they put um, Confederate flags on each grave. As you can imagine, uh, that, that, that's met with some, some bit of controversy. Um, so from the very beginning, you had these kind of dueling monuments, right? And uh, when I mentioned that these monuments could have power, say, political power, the power to um, force people to remember a conflict in a particular way. Um, there's one set of war memorials that I'm sure you guys are all familiar with, and that's Arlington National Cemetery, right? Um, President Kennedy is buried there. There's an eternal flame. Um, now, what a lot of people don't know is that it is actually the plantation of the Lee family um, in Arlington, Virginia, which was confiscated as a lot of plantations were um, basically the way that they justified it in, uh, for the federal government was, uh, these folks, because they had kind of showed allegiance to the Confederacy, they weren't paying taxes. And so therefore they were, uh, tax cheats <laughs> and, uh, the federal government was able to confiscate their land. That's, that's, that's the legalese way of how they got, um, the Arlington, uh, plot, the Lee family plot. And that's Arlington house in the background, which is the traditional family home of, of, of the Lee family. Um, now, the choice, this is actually created in 1864, and the choice to put um, a national cemetery in the Lee family house was very, very deliberate. It was no coincidence. Uh, Robert Lee obviously was a, was a famous figure in the Confederacy. Um, he had resigned his commission in the US Army uh, in order to take uh, command uh, in the Confederacy. And so, frankly, there were a lot of US Army officers and a lot of military officials that wanted the Lee family to suffer. Um, and so they decided that uh, one way to do it is to make their plantation into a cemetery. And uh, one of the things that they did, for example, this is a, starting in 1867, uh, they were burying uh, Union soldiers uh, very, very close to the house. In fact, it's said that um, when, whoops, it said that when one of the officers um, was visiting the site and saw that they were burying soldiers far away, um, he asked the detail, what are you doing? And they said, well, we were told to show a little bit of respect for the family and to not put the graves, you know, in the immediate site. And he said, oh, no, 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 no. We want them to remember this and had them put it, I'll show you a picture in a second here, right up to the door of, of, of uh, Arlington House. Um, this is uh, the prize rose garden of uh, the Lee family and the Union Army, the uh, Union military officials put a monument to unknown Union soldiers in the middle of it, just plop that big monument down in the middle of it. So again, um, these war memorials are, are, are meant to commemorate the dead. You might think that they're solemn and apolitical. I would argue that this, this had a little, bit of, uh, a little bit of meaning to it. Um, and here you can see, if you walk up to, um, to Arlington House, you can really see that uh, they weren't kidding. I mean, they laid those graves right up to the walkway um, so that the house essentially was unusable. And now it's, uh, it's the visitor center um, for um, Arlington National Cemetery. In fact, if you go to Arlington House, it's the best way you can get a, a kind of top-down view of, of, of uh, President Kennedy's grave, which I think is probably the most a uh, significant site in Arlington. They're running out of room actually in Arlington. So they, they have to have plans of 400,000 people buried there. 
Um, and it's probably one of the most significant war uh, monuments uh, in American history. Um, they also buried, for example, they kept burying people there even after the war. This is uh, Philip Sheridan, who, if you were a uh, kind of Confederate sympathist, you would have, you know, cursed his name. He had this um, very, very punitive campaign in the Valley. Um, and although he died up in New England, uh, he was buried at uh, Arlington Cemetery. In fact, uh, the burial of Sheridan, which again, in, within seeing distance, right, of Arlington House, uh, was actually considered to be one of the ways in which um, the Arlington National Military Cemetery became this kind of uh, national site. And the idea was that if you're a veteran, then you have the right to be buried there. Um, so again, these, these monuments very early on can have a political meaning. But also in the immediate aftermath of battle, you can have these strange monuments. I know that when you thought like war and monuments, you were going to think of these beautiful late 19th century kind of statues of angels holding fallen soldiers, but sometimes strange things can turn into monuments. So um, this is the Spotsylvania stump, which I don't know, have any guys, Spotsylvania stump, you can still see it? No? It's in the Smithsonian, believe it or not. So the reason why this is famous is at the Battle of Spotsylvania Courthouse, the, the, the gunfire was so intense that basically it, it chopped down trees. And uh, this stump in particular was, uh, now it looks kind of old and decrepit, but it was a very, very healthy live um, oak tree that basically was split in half by small musket fire. And um, when, when that happened, local residents removed it. Um, there was a general, Union General Miles, really wanted to keep it as kind of a souvenir and, as, and to show the kind of intensity of the fighting, wanted to make it into a monument. Um, he actually, uh, it, it said there's conflicting stories. This is the great thing about doing research in kind of war monuments and war memory, is there's often conflicting stories. One says that, um, that he bought it from somebody, but the other one, the one I want to believe because it's more interesting, is that uh, he kept asking around, he came back after the war to Spotsylvania County and he kept asking around where this stump was because he remembers seeing it. Uh, and everybody was like, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And then he went and had dinner at this place called the Spotswood Inn and asked the proprietor, and the proprietor said, I don't know. And then a waiter said, oh no, he knows, he's got it in the smokehouse. And so apparently General Miles said, you gotta give me that Spotsylvania stump. The proprietor refused. Miles had soldiers knock down the doors of the smokehouse and confiscated the stump. It, it, it went around. The reason why it's a significant war monument, even though if you saw it, you would think it's junk, right? Um, but it actually went to, you guys know the World's Fair in 1893 in Chicago. It was, it was demonstrated there. Um, it eventually made its way into the Smithsonian. Now the folks at, at, at um, the military park down in, in Spotsylvania County really want it back, but they know the Smithsonian is not gonna give it back. Uh, so it's, it's, it's too good of a story. But it's, a, it's an example of how war monuments can be made of these very, very kind of strange artifacts. And a lot of what goes on, particularly in the Civil War, are these, these very early commemorations that just are not very, well thought out or fancy. Uh, for example, uh, if you guys don't know, one of the big reasons why the Battle of Chancellorsville is uh, commemorated in the South was it was a great Southern victory and it was a moment in which uh, Stonewall Jackson, the famous Virginia general, um, did this uh, very bold flanking maneuver and uh, defeated, essentially, the Army of the Potomac. Uh, by doing this at Chancellorville in 1863. It was in many ways one of the low points of the Union in the war and one of the high points of the Confederacy. In fact, the, the victory was so resounding that Lee decides to invade Pennsylvania and Gettysburg. And I'll show you Gettysburg in a minute here. Um, but Jackson moves out ahead of his army and is shot by his own troops um, when he's returning. And uh, he dies. And uh, that's a very simple way to put it, but the commemoration of Stonewall Jackson began almost immediately after his death. In the 1870s, um, the question was, where was he shot? And they placed this kind of weird boulder there. And the idea was, if you pass by, you could say, that's where Stonewall Jackson was shot. There's nothing engraved on it, no plaque, no nothing. Uh, and we hardly have any pictures of it. But from the very early on, the kind of legend of Stonewall Jackson becomes so significant, there's actually gonna be three or four uh, monuments uh, to it. Um, uh, now, what ends up happening is, 
and this is probably the more you know traditional mom that you were thinking of when you walked into this talk right uh i didn't i mean i could show you guys uh endless images of these kinds of monuments there's there's over a thousand at gettysburg alone um but it, this is kind of a typical one and that basically it will mention the individual this is this is at Spotsylvania Courthouse, and this is uh, John Sedgwick. Um, he's in the Sixth Army Corps. He was general. He's most notable. It's it's a sad story, actually. He's most notable for uh, during the Battle of Spotsylvania, where the firing was really intense, of telling his soldiers to move up some more. And uh, I guess some of his soldiers said, the fighting's pretty intense. The fire's pretty withering. We're not going to move up. And he said, oh, they couldn't hit an elephant uh, from this distance. And then literally, like, right after he said that, he got shot. Uh, and died. And um, so his, um, usually what happens with these monuments is it's usually a unit because they have to be paid for themselves. These are private monuments. Um, at this time, Spotsylvania County is in private hands. There's no national military park. I'll tell you guys when that happens and it happens later, a lot later than you might think. So it's usually the units will raise money um, and, and will pay for this monument. Uh, then they have to secure the land and so forth. And in 1887, John Sedgwick, it was the first monument on the Spotsylvania uh, battlefield, believe it or not. Um, not the case in, in, in places where there were Union victories like Antietam and Gettysburg, where the monuments went up immediately. Uh, because uh, Chancellorsville and, and, and Spots, because they weren't resounding Union victories, there weren't a lot of immediate monuments there. Why is he showing you the John Sedgwick? Well, because the John Sedgwick monument uh, and the fact that the first monument placed in a Virginia county was by a union uh, group of soldiers was so offensive to local residents of Fredericksburg that they said, we got to do something about this. Uh, and so it spurred in the following year, the creation of another monument to Stonewall Jackson. Now, what's interesting is that granite boulder I showed you supposedly was, and nobody really knows the spot because it was in the middle of the woods. And if you if you've been to this area, it's it's, it's it's undifferentiated. It's, it's just a lot of forest and not even really any hills or, or markers. Um, in 1888, uh, led by Rufus Merchant, who was a local um, journalist who uh, used his uh, position as editor of the Fredericksburg Star to raise money for a monument to Stonewall Jackson, saying, if Sedgwick gets his monument, how the heck does Stonewall not have his? And so here you were starting to get some of these kinds of trends that we see in war monuments. So um, it's got four sides there. It's got the kind of obelisk shape. Um, this particular side is showing uh, Stonewall Jackson's last words, which were, uh, let us uh, cross over the river and rest under the shade of the trees, um, which there's a lot of debate about what it means. Does it, is it a metaphor for the Confederacy? I mean, he had been in and out of fever for about three days, so probably uh, it was just him remembering something in the past. And then on the other side, it mentions his his great victories and so forth. It's, this is a kind of classic late 19th century military monument. And they had thousands of people out there to dedicate it. Now where they put it was nowhere close to where Stonewall got shot. Uh, they put it in an area where you could see it from the railroad as you went by, uh, which is another reason to suggest that these monuments are placed for political reasons so that anybody taking the railroad through uh, the Spotsylvania, that area of Spotsylvania County could see it and could see that it was the monument um, to Stonewall Jackson. Now, his cult gets uh, to be really huge in the late 19th century in, in the American South. One of his, uh, his former pastor, James P. Smith, in 1903, uh, takes it upon himself to commemorate certain areas around the area. And so he puts these very kind of simple stones, because he was paying for it himself, um, and he places about five or six of them all around the area. I'll show you another one uh, in a second, a little, little otter. Um, and that is where he died, which again, monuments can be political. Um, when Stoma was shot, he was put into an ambulance cart, was jostled around a lot. They think that caused a lot of internal bleeding. Uh, he, he had lost his arm. They amputated his arm almost immediately. And then they took him to, um, if you see in the background there, uh, it was a doctor's office at the Guinea Station Plantation, which is now gone, but they preserved the railroad. Actually, when they purchased the land, they preserved that house because they had heard it was where Stonewall died, right? So, so another example of, like the Spotsylvania stump, of something that would have been ordinary and probably would have been torn down, 
uh, except it has this meaning, this value, historical value, that this is where Stonewall died. Uh, Smith put the marker there uh, that lists when he died on May 10th, uh, a few days after the Battle of Chancellorsville. Um, and if you go into there, and I would highly recommend that you do, uh, first of all, it's fascinating to me that it used to be called the Stonewall Jackson Shrine. It is not anymore. It is now called uh, the Stonewall Jackson Death Site. <laughs> right? So that should give you a sense of how the politics of this have all changed. And it, but if you go into that room, they have the room set exactly. They have a clock set to the minute he died. They have a bed that's like got the sheets turned over. Um, it's really eerie. Um, and uh, it, 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 it still looks like a shrine, even though they don't call it a shrine. And it's, it really gets to the kind of power of these monuments in, in projecting these myths. In this case, the idea that Stonewall Jackson was this phenomenal Southern patriot. Now, as I mentioned, it gets a little strange. Stonewall had his arm amputated at the Lacey Plantation. And there is actually a marker that uh, places where his arm is buried. Now, like I mentioned, you know, these are private sites. The Lacey Farm was still private at the time that this uh, marker went up. Sean? Yeah. Let me switch with you. I see your oh. mic just went red. Sure. Okay. Is this working? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, you know, it's 1903. This, this is not, again, it's not a public place. This is still a private residence at the time. I guess they agreed. That's fine. The arm's buried there. So, uh, so we'll put the marker there. Um, what they would often do, though, was the U.S. Army, and I don't have time to get into the whole background of national military parks, but the U.S. Army and Marines used to drill on these sites. They would use them as kind of training centers. In the 1920s, um, the Marines, and in a, a particular uh, Marine general, uh, came to this site. They had been doing maneuvers, and he basically said, I don't believe there's an arm there. And so they actually had his soldiers dig it up. They, they claimed to have found a box with arm bones in it, and then they reburied it. The National Park Service, though, says they've done all sorts of surveys, and they don't really believe that. But um, you can't go and, and, and dig it up. But you know, it's funny, the rangers would always tell me, like, that was one of the, before they started marking it, that was one of the biggest questions they got. Like, we heard that you got Stonewall arm, Stonewall's arm here somewhere. Um, so it can, war monuments, like I said, they can be kind of strange. Um, now, you guys have probably maybe been to Gettysburg. If you haven't, definitely go. It is a different landscape than the county that I'm studying um, because, as I said, the monuments kind of came fast and furious after the war. It was a great military victory. Uh, Abraham Lincoln, in many ways, um, kind of consecrated that ground with the Gettysburg Address. Uh, although, I don't know if you guys know this, uh, you know, no one heard him. Uh, you guys have heard that story that the, the speaker before him spoke for like 55 minutes to an hour uh, and then Lincoln get up and you can read the whole Gettysburg Address in like two and a half, three minutes. Uh, but but later on, it became this kind of uh, consecration of, of, of the ground at Gettysburg. They have a national military cemetery there, um, like a lot of these battle sites. And they have monuments literally everywhere, everywhere in Gettysburg. You cannot, you know, in fact, um, a lot of people who visit Gettysburg say there are so many monuments that it actually takes away from the experience of seeing the battle that it's hard to kind of envision a battle being there because there are so many monuments. Um, and now again, at first, the first kind of wave of these monuments were, were very rudimentary. Um, they were put in place for particular reasons. Veterans, once they kind of, you know, had recovered, um, would sometimes go back uh, maybe show their sons, daughters where they had fought. And they would want to know kind of, you know, I mean, they had a general idea, but it, obviously that day was pretty traumatic for a lot of them. And so one of the first things that veterans organizations did when they had monuments was not to build big elaborate statues, but was to put what they called flank markers. So in other words, you want to know, you knew that you were in the, um, the uh, West Virginia Infantry, in the 29th West Virginia Infantry, um, that is showing the left flank uh, of the West Virginia Infantry. And then you can see um, the right flank of the 75th, I believe that's Pennsylvania Infantry. Um, so you could literally kind of see where you were on the battlefield from these flank markers. And they're, they're everywhere. In fact, 
um, the, the Park Service has to be careful that they don't get weeded over and, and, and actually disappear because they're, they're quite modest. But this is the kind of first generation of, uh, of these monuments. If you want an example of, uh, if, I don't know if you call it monument bloat or, or something, it's definitely the Pennsylvania monument. Um, you know, Gettysburg is in Pennsylvania. Um, this is the Gilded Age, right? So there tends to be a little bit of government excess, let's just say. Um, now, this is completed in 1910, but it had been planned and paid for and constructed over a long time. In fact, uh, it became quite controversial in Pennsylvania state government. It was, it was finally completed at the cost of mil what today would be millions of dollars. It was way over budget. Uh, and when people first went to see it, I mean, they were impressed with it. If you go in there, and I highly recommend you visit the Pennsylvania Monument, they have uh, statues uh, there in the corner of all of the commanding generals who are from Pennsylvania. There's a winged victory on top. Um, there's lists of all the soldiers on the inside. It's beautiful marble. I mean, it's, it's a gorgeous edifice. Um, but it, like I said, it became quite controversial because of the cost overruns. And in fact, some people have joked that uh, they're worried that at some point, all the other little monuments at Gettysburg are going to start orbiting uh, the monument around from Pennsylvania because it's so huge. Um, you can't miss it. And this is what the landscape looked like. And there you can see it. I mean, it just, you know, it's like a, it's like a massive structure in the middle of the uh, battlefield. Uh, and these are more kind of the common ones, right? Where you'll get the, 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 the unit, uh, you'll usually get a kind of commemorative poem. These tend to be all the kind of same about sacrifice and so forth. Um, you might get a unique image. Uh, most of these in the beginning were Union. The, Virginia was the first state to put a monument in Gettysburg in 1917. Um, so the South is late to putting monuments on, uh, on, on Northern victory battlefields. But uh, yeah, so, so this is what the landscape looks like at Gettysburg. It is, it is monument rich. For sure, you can't go five feet without running into one. In fact, if you want the statistics on that, um, you can see that uh, Gettysburg is, is in many ways um, the most uh, remembered place in America. That's, that's what I like to call it because they have 1,328 monuments, markers, and memorials. Washington, on the other hand, which you, know, you could say in Washington you see a monument every five feet, but they only have uh, 19 main ones and 80 historic structures and 150 named landmarks. So war monuments in the Civil War, are very, very common. And Gettysburg is, the, is definitely the epicenter of it. Now, um, there are other Civil War battlefields, obviously, that have uh, monuments in them. And, and as I mentioned, they all tend to kind of follow the same um, pattern of usually a, a kind of um, one of these uh, marble stone structures uh, with maybe a soldier on top, um, uh, noting the unit, uh, noting sometimes what that unit did there, um, often uh, with the money raised by private um, veterans groups. Uh, still, we're still not in the public area yet. Um, and Antietam is also interesting because it uh, is a landscape that holds the William McKinley Monument in 1903. Um, now, some of you might know uh, that William McKinley was president, right? Before Theodore Roosevelt, he was assassinated by a uh, anarchist. And uh, he did fight in the Civil War. He was only about 19 at the time. Uh, and uh, what he is commemorated for, now this monument was put up in 1903 after McKinley had died. So he wasn't particularly noteworthy during the Civil War. They had to think, you know, he didn't necessarily make a heroic stand at Burnside Bridge um, he didn't, um, you know, single-handedly charge into the cornfield. He didn't do any of the things that we might think would earn you a war monument. But what he did do, which is shown here, is he served hot coffee uh, and provisions to soldiers out in the field um, under a lot of fire, apparently. Now, this has, again, not been really confirmed, but nonetheless, McKinley was an important political figure. And in 1903, and in the early 20th century, if you wanted to be an important political figure, you wanted to be associated with the Civil War, right? It is America's Iliad. It is, it is the major uh, conflict at the time. Um, it was something that, although many people tried their hardest to get out of fighting in it in the 1860s, later on, uh, they're quite embarrassed if they weren't. In fact, there's an argument that Theodore Roosevelt, the reason why Theodore Roosevelt was so obsessed with 
manliness and fighting and so forth and why he made the Rough Riders was he was ashamed because his father had bought himself out of the Civil War draft. Um, and so what we start to see are these politicians all of a sudden are getting Civil War monuments on battlefields when, um, when they were quite young when they fought in them. Now, these monuments are still going up today. Um, this is as, you know, we like to think that these are things that, well, there was the kind of sweet spot of monuments. For those of you that have followed this controversy of, of Civil War soldier monuments in Southern towns, there's an area from about 1890s up through the 1920s that, that the vast majority of these were put up. It's a period where the interpretation of the Civil War is this kind of noble struggle against Union oppression called the Lost Cause. It's when that kind of myth rose to prominence in the South. And so as an act of defiance, a lot of Southern towns, including Gainesville, would put statues of, of Civil War soldiers. But they are still putting them up now. This is the most recent one in Spotsylvania. Um, I took a picture of it uh, the last time I was there. It's from 2009. It's a little different. Now, this is put up by the Sons of Confederate Veterans, um, which is a um, you know pro-Confederate group. And uh, but But if you notice there, uh, it's very simplistic in the design. Now, this, this is on a national park site, so it would have to be approved um, by the Park Service. And so it just lists the kind of names uh, and uh, the units that fought there. But this is an ongoing process of, of making more and more monuments, um, even in places where they, they didn't exist much. And of course, these monuments, um, as I mentioned, this lost cause uh, mythology, um, you know, soon after the war, when the veterans started to age a little bit and a new generation that didn't necessarily remember the war firsthand came into being, the idea of how to remember the war um, changed. And in particular on Monument Avenue, and you'll see a picture of this a little later, this, this particular monument. In 1890, it was a big affair in uh, Richmond, Virginia, because they had the dedication of the Robert E. Lee equestrian statue um, on Monument Avenue. Now, if you know Richmond at all, Monument Avenue essentially links downtown with the kind of museum district. It's, it's got these beautiful uh, big homes. It's, it's, a, it's a massive wide uh, avenue and it has statues to Robert E. Lee. Stonewall Jackson had a statue there. Um, I think Jeb Lee or Jeb, Jeb Stewart rather had a statue there. Um, and um, they're huge equestrian statues, which by the way, what I learned from working with the park services, equestrian statues. If you look at them at uh, at, at ground level, the horses look tiny. Uh, because if you have an equestrian statue and you're looking at it from up top, if the horse was an actual size, the horse would just dwarf the human being that's up there. So uh, occasionally, what would happen is in these monuments. So this is what happened to the Long Street Monument at, at Gettysburg. Um, originally, they were going to put them on a big pedestal, and they ran out of money. And Long Street is kind of discredited among Confederate circles, anyways. And so they put him on the ground and everyone kept asking the rangers like why is he riding this tiny little horse and they have to explain like you know what was meant to be up on a pedestal so and um so the 1890 celebration is interesting because you don't see it in this image but reports were that folks were out waving confederate for the first time that uh white southerners kind of felt comfortable waving confederate flags in, in, in public it was no longer um considered treasonous uh, and instead, this area became kind of a veneration of the Confederacy. Now, sometimes these monuments and the idea of how we memorialize are uh, represented by particular events. And this is the 50th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg in 1863. And um, the federal government agreed to pay for every veteran of Gettysburg to come to this encampment. Um, now, you know, it was 50 years ago, so a lot of these guys were in their um, late 60s, 70s, 80s, um, but, but hundreds, I think thousands of them even came. There's Woodrow Wilson, uh, the president, first Southern president since the Civil War, um, who gave a speech at uh, the encampment. So it was a really big deal when the president comes to visit. They had all these buttons, they had um, any number of events um, and it represented a particular idea about the Civil War, which was, you know, obviously it was horrible. We were killing each other back then, but now we're all about reunification, right? We're all about burying the hatchet and so forth. And so there were these uh, 
I would call them like living monuments to the Civil War uh, that acknowledged the sacrifice, but didn't really acknowledge the conflict. So um, they reenact Pickett's charge. Now, I, you know, the opportunity for post-traumatic stress disorder is really, really high, I'd imagine here. You had veterans of the Confederate forces that made Pickett's charge. Here they are uh, walking across the field uh, in a reenactment. And then, of course, when they got to the uh, Union line and the Union veterans were there waiting for them, they didn't shoot at each other or anything like that. They shook hands. Um, so, and as you notice here, you know, they've, they've got, it's a photo op, right? They've, they've got these guys uh, that are shaking hands, a kind of sign of reconciliation. Um, and it's soon afterwards that uh, because this conflict had been, I don't want to say diminished, but had, had been made into something that could be talked about, uh, that could be commemorated in a way that maybe wasn't as drastic as putting Union graves at Robert E. Lee's ancestral home, um, there was a movement to make these national military parks at these sites of, of, of battles. And there's two kind of philosophies of doing this, um, two models. The first is the Chickamauga model. Uh, Chickamauga is uh, right outside of, I believe, uh, Chattanooga um, and uh, in, in Tennessee. And uh, what they did there was the federal government just purchased the entire battlefield, right? Um, and they were able to, because it's not a very uh, settled area, it's not a very valuable area, uh, they were just basically able to purchase the entire battlefield and then start the process of kind of laying out the battle lines, building roads, doing all that sort of stuff you have to do in order to, to facilitate visitors to a national military park. Um, the more common, this isn't the, sorry that the contrast isn't coming out as well. The more common model though, is what's called the Antietam model. So there's a Chickamauga model, which is you buy everything. Uh, and then there's the Antietam model, where what you do, and this is important for monuments, um, because keep in mind, those monuments are in place at the time of the federal government. Uh, so the National Park Service, uh, the, the National Military Parks come into being in the late 1920s. Um, the Park Service takes it over during the Roosevelt administration in the 1930s. Um, and so by that time, there had been monuments on these battlefields, in some cases, for 50 years. And so what the federal government there does is they have to determine, this is what I'm interested in, the value, the historical value of the land. Uh, and then they would purchase it and link it by roads. So there are still, if you go to Antietam, there's still working farms uh, in between uh, these monuments. And the battlefield that I've been talking about a lot and studying is actually, it's a blend of, um, uh, well, it's mainly the Antietam model. Um, and this is the way that they've uh, commemorated the Battle of the Wilderness, those scenes that I showed you immediately. And they've, they've identified these eight significant sites along a road. You do a driving tour and you see stuff. Now, I want you to notice, so um, sometimes monuments can be uh, living monuments that turn into other monuments. Um, this is Tap Field. And during the Battle of the Wilderness, which is really more of a draw, I guess, um, between the Union and Confederates, but it looked like the Confederates were going to lose. Um, and uh, Robert E. Lee organizes a, a, a counterattack. And he's on the field. And uh, he's got this Texas, Texas unit, and he's rallying them. And uh, apparently, uh, according to all eyewitnesses, uh, Lee wanted to lead the counterattack himself. And and the Texans said, you know, no, lead to the rear, lead to the rear, you're too valuable, and, and so sent him to the rear. Now, you would think, like, you know, well, this is a, a what happens, right, uh, in, in military battles. But it becomes this huge, huge thing because a guy named Douglas Southall Freeman wrote about it uh, very lyrically and uh, used it to kind of enhance the, 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 the legend of Robert E. Lee. And so the lead to the rear site, at Tap Farm, there was a widow Tap who owned this farm, uh, all of a sudden goes from being a very marginal farm in Spotsylvania County, which has marginal soil, which wasn't very good for making tobacco or growing tobacco or really growing wheat or really growing anything. Most uh, farmers in uh, Spotsylvania were pretty poor. In fact, um, through the mid uh, 20th century, about 30% of them lived below the poverty line. But all of a sudden Tap Farm becomes pretty important, pretty valuable. In fact, the National Park Service wants Douglas Southall Freeman to, to buy it uh, for the Park Service. But the problem is, and this is where you can get living monuments. It's one of my favorite stories. Um, Feeney Tap, 
Um, this is her being interviewed by uh, the first park ranger, first park historian uh, at Spotsylvania uh, National Military Park, uh, Ralph Happel, in 1937. And Feeney had been alive um, during the Civil War. She had, uh, she could talk about hearing the cannons and she had all these stories. Um, now, Feeney was a bit of a character. Um, she, in the early 19th century, had actually been put on trial uh, for miscegenation. This was Virginia. This was the Jim Crow South. Uh, she had a long-standing relationship with an African-American man. Um, she was a, a colorful character by all accounts. She had what was called a pocket deed to Tap Farm, which meant essentially she hadn't filed the paperwork, uh, but at any given moment she could pull it out and, uh, and show ownership of Tap Farm. So the Park Service liked to work with her. They would actually send people to go talk to Feeney. She would sit out on her porch like this, and they would ask her questions and she would kind of tell them about it. She'd throw in a few choice words that maybe offended people. Um, and uh, she was this kind of living monument. Uh, and uh, when she passed, Tap Farm got put up for sale. And the idea was, how are you going to commemorate this? Uh, you know, now that, now that Feeney's no longer here to talk, talk about the history of, of the Civil War. And as always, you know, there's a, there's a, I hope you see a pattern here. First thing they did was uh, veterans, uh, put up a stone, the lead to the rear stone, uh, which had been put up actually before Feeney even uh, came out of the picture in 1891. Um, and as you can see there, it's, there's nothing distinguishing about it other than the fact that it's a stone in the middle of a field. Um, in fact, it kept sinking and the Park Service really worried, what are we gonna do? We have to lift it up. Uh, and so um, then there is a movement to put uh, the same guy that put up Stonewall Jackson's arm and uh, those monuments puts up Lee to the rear, cry the Texans, All right? So there's the second kind of generation of monuments. Then in the 1960s, um, something I'll talk about in a second here, the centennial of the Civil War occurs in the state of Texas, because they were Texas units. Texas is very proud of their history. Uh, they wanted to put a monument up. Long negotiations because the Na uh, National Park Service said, well, we want the monument to be like this. Texas said, no, it has to be big, right? It has to be made of pink Texas limestone. Uh, I actually have the correspondence uh, that they have between the park rangers, park historians, and Texas officials. Park historians get very exasperated at one point, uh, but they eventually got their monument uh, in 1964, and they got to put all the text they wanted to. The Park Service, I think, said, like, you can't put all this text. But this is, they have a quote, actually, from Douglas Southall Freeman. Uh, his words, and he wrote that book, uh, Lee's Lieutenants, in the 1930s. Um, his words had become so kind of memorialized that it's actually on the monument in pink Texas limestone. Um, so those are generations of, of the kind of Lee to the rear story. Now, as I mentioned, there's a Civil War centennial, right? And this is where we see a lot of renewed interest in the Civil War, although, again, it's become somewhat controversial because, of course, what's going on in the 1960s, the civil rights movement, um, what ends up happening is in the Civil War centennial, it becomes less a memory of the actual history, more a memory of what we call the kind of blue and gray story. Uh, there were two armies, they showed up and they fought. We don't really want to talk about what they're fighting for, why they're fighting. Um, for example, um, Commemorations of battles all occurred in the Civil War Centennial. They had some money and they, they, they built a bunch of stuff like the, the Virginia Civil War Centennial Center in Richmond, Big Dome. Uh, and you went and visited there, you'd see a lot about Civil War soldiers. You didn't see a lot about causes. You didn't see almost anything about slavery. Um, and, uh, you know, the anniversaries of battles were celebrated. The anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation. The 100th anniversary, 1963, January 1st, President Kennedy was at the Orange Bowl, uh, was not celebrating the Emancipation Proclamation or the 100th anniversary. And it really gets to the power of that idea of the blue and the gray, that we're going to depoliticize this, this fight, and that shows up in the, in the monuments. I'll give you an example of it. Uh, it's from Fredericksburg, of course. But um, if you go to the Fredericksburg battlefield, and you can see it's a well-preserved battlefield, you can see the old stone wall where the Confederates kind of lined up and, and really decimated the Union Army. Um, but this is, the, this is the kind of monument that's occurring by 1965. Um, it's called the Angel of Fredericksburg, and it's Richard Kirkland. Uh, 
And if you see there, I, I don't know if you can read it, it says, at the risk of his life, this American soldier of sublime compassion brought water to his wounded foes at Fredericksburg, the fighting men on both sides of the line. They called him the Angel of Mary's Heights. N notice they don't say Confederate. I mean, he's from the Confederacy, he fights for South Carolina. Uh, they say this American soldier of sublime compassion. We don't actually know if, if this transpired the way that the legend did, that he went out because in the Battle of Fredericksburg, the Union forces were kind of marching up this, this hill. It was awful. It was exposed, and the Confederate soldiers were just mowing them down. Uh, and so after wave after wave, there were all these wounded soldiers laying on the field. And, and supposedly, according to some eyewitnesses, although I think a lot of historians say we don't know if it actually was him, we don't know if it was if he went did as much as they said he did, um, Kirkland went out and gave them water and, and comfort. But this is the kind of monument that showed up in 1965, the idea that um, this was a struggle, but it wasn't really an ideological struggle and certainly not as, as nasty a struggle as we know it was. And then, of course, as we get even further, <laughs> monuments have to be contextualized, right? And this is one of my favorite examples. And there's a lot of text here. It's funny, but you know, it, it, the further we get from this, the actual war, the more text that gets put on the monument to explain it. And in this case, this is, uh, so I'm sorry, it's a little washed out, you can't read that. Up on the left there, in 1918, there was an African-American um, uh, college called Storer College, it's now defunct um, in Harper's Ferry. And they actually had the John Brown chair <laughs> there. Um, and Frederick Douglass gave the comment, and they gave the speech commemorating the John Brown chair. And, um, and in 1918, they put a monument up to John Brown that basically said, hey, this is where the struggle for black freedom started. Uh, and John Brown started it at Harper's Ferry. The uh, Daughters of the Confederacy didn't like that. We got a couple generations of the lost cause. So in 1931, they put this monument up down the way uh, that highlights the idea that Hayward Shepard, who was a um, clerk for the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, was actually the first casualty. He was black. He was a free African-American. Was the first casualty of the John Brown raid. Um, and so they put this long monument, uh, and uh, this, I don't know if you can uh, read it on the bottom, but it said, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the, it's called the Faithful Slave Monument because it says it's a monument to Hayward Shepherd, who wasn't enslaved, but uh, in the faithfulness of thousands of Negroes who under many temptations throughout the subsequent years of war so conducted themselves that no stain was left upon a record of which the pecu peculiar heritage of the American people, uh, peculiar heritage, right, slavery, uh, and an everlasting tribute to the best in both races. So a uh, nice kind of happy spin on it. Then in 2006, the National Park Service decided we need to contextualize that. Uh, and so they added their uh, kind of explanation of uh, Hayward Shepard, who he was, why um, the kind of pro-Confederate folks were so interested in commemorating him and, and reminding Americans that the first casualty of the John Brown raid was actually African-American. Um, and if you go to Harper's Ferry, as again, I, I highly recommend it, you can actually see these monuments uh, are kind of in, in line with one another. Now, I think most people visit it and they have no idea what's going on here, but these are essentially, I mean, if they could talk, these monuments would be yelling at each other, right? Um, because they're meant to be um, uh, contradicting. And recently, we've seen monuments become quite controversial. This is that same monument that I showed you guys earlier. This is the Lee Equestrian uh, Memorial in 1890 that was put up to great Confederate uh, fair. It was um, during the Black Lives Matter protests. Uh, most of these statues on, um, on, uh, on Monument Avenue didn't fare so well. Richmond, you know, Richmond struggled with this for a long time. Richmond, if you've been there, it's, it, there are a lot of black residents of, of Richmond who don't like uh, the fact that the Confederacy is so enshrined there. This is, the city tried to, you know, they put an uh, Arthur Ashe, a black tennis player, uh, is from Richmond, and they put an Arthur Ashe statue on Monument Avenue of like him holding up a tennis racket, uh, but it didn't really fit the, the, the move. And I don't think the African American community was too thrilled that it didn't negate what, what they thought was pretty offensive about um, most of these Confederate equestrian monuments. And then, of course, after uh, Black Lives Matter, um, and George Floyd, it, it kind of erupted. Um, now they're gone. Uh, so uh, they were moved. And somebody asked me uh, before where they are. I, I 
don't know. I think that they are going to be relocated to a museum, but I'm not certain. I know that a lot of uh, the statues that were um, removed, um, the ones that weren't destroyed, uh, that were removed by the city officials, uh, a lot of them are in storage, uh, kind of awaiting um, heritage groups um, to see if they want to take them. But but it's another example of, you know, this is a monument that you would have thought, oh, you know, it's, it's over 100 years old and, you know, those times are past, but these things still still have meaning. And I know that I've gone a long time, but I want to leave you with something that's a little closer to home. That's another example of dueling monuments, of, of monuments that are placed in close proximity to one another that have uh, a, a different story to tell. And it's a lusty battlefield, which is Florida's really only significant uh, battle of the Civil War. It was a Confederate victory. Uh, it's significant in that um, it was uh, it was an attempt in 1864, in February of 1864, for the Union to try to reconstruct Florida. The idea was uh, if forces from Jacksonville could go across the state, capture Tallahassee, they could, Florida was almost uh, a, a kind of um, example for reconstruction, but the Confederates thwarted them. And it's significant also in that it was uh, African-American soldiers fighting for the Union uh, made up the bulk of the Union forces there. In fact, the 54th Massachusetts, which is the really famous one uh, that's, that's commemorated in the movie Glory, there's a big 54th Massachusetts monument in Boston right across from the State House. They were actually held in reserve at Alusty. They were at Alusty. Um, and, um, and it's also a, a significant battle because, and this, this is the ugly part of this battle, is apparently after um, the battle was over and there were wounded Union soldiers in the field, um, Confederate soldiers uh, executed them. Um, and uh, we know this, you know, it, it, it as, as everything with this, it gets controversial and people claim it's not true. Historians know this from the letters of Confederate officers who said they tried to stop them, these soldiers from doing that. Um, so, you know, this, this was not just kind of propaganda. This, this in fact, happened. And so a lusty, you know, is, 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 is tough to commemorate. And if you go to a lusty, you can see two things. You can see the official monument. Um, there it is on the left. And hopefully you can see this is the kind of classic standard monument right uh it's a stone pillar uh there's some images uh there's uh some slogans about how florida uh, soldiers defended hearth and home um all the kind of notes are there for a 1912 monument and it's it's striking um it's on the official park grounds in fact the lusty state park is the first um state park i think in Flo in florida um, and the park system grew from that. Uh, they still do a reenactment of the battle um, because they are allowed to, because um, in national parks, you're not allowed to have reenactments where muskets are aimed at each other. Uh, you can do demonstration of it, but you have to have all kinds of permission and licenses. Well, lusty, they do it every year. Um, and they have big grandstands and uh, they have like a MC. Uh, who narrates the battle and he says, are we going to let the Yankees win this year? And everyone says, no. And it's, it's, it, it is interesting um, to see. Now, off the way on a private cemetery, and this is why this is probably never going to become part of the official park. When Union soldiers came back in the 1860s and they knew that the Union soldiers had been buried in a mass grave, that's usually what happened. The, the folks that held the battlefield usually sent their own burial details to exhume or, or, or retrieve the bodies of their own side, but they usually buried in mass graves, uh, the ones on the other side. The Union did that to the Confederacy, the Confederacy did that to the Union. Um, they put a wooden cross to mark where this mass grave was. And in 1991, a Union organization, private, Union organization in Florida. Um, I don't know if it's Sons of Union Veterans or I, I, I I'm not quite certain who it was. Um, basically built this stone cross in the middle of this private cemetery uh, to commemorate this. And if you notice that, it says to the memory of the officers and soldiers of the United States Army who fell at the Battle of Alusty. And so the big controversy is, and uh, you know, I'm kind of glad I'm not involved in this. I got enough stuff going on, but the big controversy is whether there is going to be a union monument on the official Alusty battlefield or whether they're gonna allow this kind of informal thing to happen. I thought about writing a book about the Battle of Alusty. I was gonna call it the Many Battles of Alusty and talk about this memory battle as well. And so I interviewed people 
at the reenactment for two years and it was fascinating <laughs> in a lot of ways. Um, and uh, almost all of them told me there's already a union memorial at Alusty. We don't want one on the state grounds. So, you know, what started as a kind of simple way, hopefully you guys can see that, is to commemorate where soldiers had fallen has turned into, uh, and I'm assuming will continue to be this kind of political flashpoint. So these war monuments on the surface seem deceptively simple, but I would argue that they have a lot of complexity to them. So that's all I have for you guys today. And thank you for being so patient as I talked about it. Right. Okay, we're open for comments and questions online or uh, here at uh, Okamek. Um, thank you. I, I don't, can't speak for everybody, but for me, the hour just sped by. <laughs> um, I was familiar with um, some of the general ideas about the public controversy about um, a lot of the national and state um, monuments. But what I really keyed into was I really had not understood until you presented it was how it is that um, different communities and different groups of people from the bottom up would argue that their history had to be represented in a um, concrete fashion. Mm -hmm. And that something like the Spotsylvania stump had to, had to reify what events transpired there and what it meant to them. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you have ever um, seen that elsewhere in other countries where um, there is spontaneously some kind of celebration of exactly the same kind of thing. I've seen um, things in uh, World War II France mm -hmm. where, you know, it'll commemorate a, with a little tiny plaque, you know, these um, um, patriots were murdered here, mm -hmm. but they always seem to be a national government or a national government entity kind of thing. So I wondered if you could yeah. talk about the dynamics. Um, this is much more of a fluid kind of um, establishment of monuments than I would have yeah. thought. Right, well, and, and that's, I think, um, you know, the, the Civil War, when I wanted to, when, when I got asked to talk about war and monuments, I mean, I'm an Americanist by training, so um, that's naturally what I thought about, but it's also the Civil War, I think, is probably the most commemorated uh, conflict in, in, in world history, um, in that, you know, you really don't find significant numbers of, of reenactors of World War I and World War II. They're out there, uh, but not to the extent the Civil War is. Um, and, you know, the, the closest thing I came to, um, because the United States is a secular, sec, secular nation, when I was researching things like the Spotsylvania stump, what I found that was really um, kind of parallel was actually not war monuments, because I, I agree with you, they're very different in, in, in Europe. Um, it was it was relics, religious relics. So, you know, if you go to um, a church in Italy, you know, they'll have a bone from a particular saint. Is it a bone from that saint? Uh, you know, probably not. Um, and the same thing is true of, of Civil War things. I mean, what I find interesting about Spotsylvania County was, because it had four battles fought and the county never really got a break, um, in 1864 and 1865, Residents weren't saying like, look at all these invaluable relics of personal sacrifice we see. They said, look at all this junk. What are we going to do with it? So, you know, at some point, there's this alchemy that occurs where trash becomes commemorative. Um, and as an economic kind of historian, that's what fascinates me. I don't think that has happened as much in, in, in Europe uh, for some reason. I don't know that, um, you know, it's interesting. I was just listening to a podcast about the Franco-Prussian War of 1870 uh, this morning as I was mowing the yard and I was thinking about this talk and I was thinking, and they were saying like, you know, that it's been kind of a forgotten war because it tends to stir things up, right? You know, I mean, if you think about Franco-Prussian War as like the, the, the German state was founded and they, they got confiscate all this French land and the French re resented it and so forth. It just, there's nothing good that came out of it. The Paris Commune came out of it. So we just have forgotten about it. Uh, Americans will never forget about their civil war, right? And uh, we have all these relics and these national uh, uh, battle parks 
Um, the National Battle Park is a unique thing. You know, battlefields were always kind of remembered, um, but it was often in a very informal way, as you said, a very fluid way. And the idea that we have this kind of official memory of the Civil War is really interesting. I mean, the reason, the whole reason I start, I came to Spotsylvania County was because the National Park Service uh, asked me to do a history of Catherine Furnace, which is an iron furnace um, on the site of the Chancellorsville Battlefield. Now I'm an industrial historian and they had the ledger book. And so I did the history of this furnace. And one of the rangers told me, we really want this to be uh, something other than a site that Stonewall Jackson marched by, right? Because uh, that's why it was known. It was the reference point that Stonewall did his famous flanking maneuver. And the National Park Service has done this in a number of sites where they've reinterpreted, they've tried to put um, more of a history of slavery and more of a context, and they're trying to move away from this blue and the gray narrative. Um, and, and they've come up with a lot of pushback. Uh, people find that blue and gray narrative safe. Um, and so, you know, um, I don't know what, you know, that's an interesting question as to why in, in, in European nations, it tends to be kind of official commemorations. I have a colleague who is, um, who does Russian history and he's, he, he spent a lot of time in Russia and, and he has a relative coincidentally that's really involved in commemorating one of the massive tank battles. And, you know, and, 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 and there are all these tank parts out in the middle of the field. And, you know, if you go to the locals, they'll go show them to you, but there's no, you know, official commemoration of it or anything. And now they're saying, look, this is almost a hundred years old. You know, we should have some kind of commemoration. I'm not asking you to do another hour, but I'm asking if you would just, um, in a couple sentences, tell us how this, how the Revolutionary War um, memorials differ from um, the Civil War. Right. So, Revolutionary battles occurred uh, before national military parks, and you do have them. Um, they're difficult to uh, kind of commemorate because they're smaller. They're they're in places like New York. Um, the 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 best one I've seen is actually at Yorktown. Um, what they, uh, how they differ? That's an interesting question. I mean, you know, there's there's maybe less visible marks. If you go to Civil War uh, national uh, battlefields, including the ones that I study, you can still see trenches. Um, and we have a lot of artifacts from there. The revolutionary uh, battle sites are, are older. Um, and so it's difficult to kind of see how that battle occurred. Um, you know, close to where I grew up, I grew up in Morgantown, West Virginia. There's, it's not, it's not revolutionary war, but it's, it's close to it. Um, the battle of Fort necessity, which, uh, George Washington <laughs> kind of made a bad military move and, and built this tiny fort in the middle of a floodplain and let the French and Indians kind of shoot at him constantly, uh, from under tree cover. And so that's when I think about when I think about that era of, um, of military commemoration and what you don't see. I think, are the kinds of um, impromptu memorials from veterans and so forth that you see in Civil War battlefields. If you go to a Civil War battlefield, um, like I said, those, those monuments predate the actual park. In northern New York and northern Vermont, I spent a lot of time up there doing biology yeah. and other things. Um, they, they're in public parks. Oh, are they? Yeah, yeah. They're, they're in downtown park. There's be a monument, and uh, and they they reenact. And Maverick, when I was up there, they did. Uh, Canada sent a ship down, and they <laughs> yeah. they had a battle on the, the Revolutionary the War, the Battle of eighteen twelve. Um, that was eighteen twelve. Yeah, they yeah. did the, the Canadians like to reenact the Battle of eighteen twelve because they it they won hysterical. all those battles. Yeah, it was um, really funny. Yeah, well, yeah, that's 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 really interesting. The bunker, you know, there's a there's a big mine. I should say, the big monument at Bunker Hill. If you ever go there, it's massive, you know, obelisk. Um, but it took years to build, uh, years to build. They kept running out of money, and you know, I mean, so, um, so you know, it's the, the Civil War. I think because so many millions of Americans fought in it, and they had these very strong, politically active veterans organizations. I think that's maybe what what made it different. Yep. Other comments. I think the obvious thing that also makes it different is we are constantly reminded that we have the African American population in America that is a constant reminder of the Civil War. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, and and their history and commemoration is is a fascinating one. They originally uh, African American Union soldiers were involved in Decoration Day, uh, but uh, and they would go to Southern uh, cemeteries where Union veterans were 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 buried, and they would participate in that. Uh, as a result of Jim Crow, they were systematically excluded from that to the point where. Uh, in some southern cemeteries, they actually exhumed the bodies of uh, black Union soldiers and put them in a separate sod. So even in death, you know, you couldn't have. And 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 that wasn't a long held tradition, right? I mean, that's something that occurred, but but it affected the memory. So yeah, it it. And obviously, the the. I'm I'm very conflicted about this monument discussion. Um, the historian in me wants to say we shouldn't tear them down. We should we should commemorate them and contextualize them. But as a reminder to myself, I put that Harper's Ferry story up there where, you know, it's just, what are we gonna have like eight mm. things contextualizing the original monument? Because history and our interpretations change, you know, every, every few years. So I, I really, you know, I, I wish there was an easy answer to that, whether they should stay, whether they should be torn down. You know, I, I, I am not like some of my colleagues who have, uh, you know, in history, who have very, easy kind of solutions to that, either rip them all down or keep them all standing. So, you know, I'm preempting that question if any of y'all ask me whether I think they should be torn down. Any other comments? You may have um, mentioned this earlier because I came in late and I apologize for that. But yesterday there was a lot on television about the Emmett Till memorials. Mm -hmm. how, how does that relate to what you've talked about today? Um, it, it, it's, it's interesting. I think that um, in the Emmett Till case, it's obviously a really painful event in US history. Um, the Civil War, as a historian, when I study the Civil War, I also see it as a painful event in US history. But I think that over time, um, the Civil War became in many ways, it became the blue and the gray. It became these kinds of uh, symbols of of martial prowess and 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 gallantry. Um, and we forgot the kind of horrific nature of. We forgot about that skeleton in in, in the wilderness. Um, I think that the Emmett Till monument is going to be different in that I don't know that anyone's going to come away from that monument feeling good, right? Um, and uh, but but I think that it will have an impact, which is important. I think it will uh, mean that that event won't be forgotten. Um, but I suspect that, uh, I don't know, I mean, in, in the coverage that you saw, was it at all controversial? Or was it just reporting it? Just reporting it. Just reporting it, yeah. Um, because I know that in the past there have been impromptu monuments to civil rights sites that have been vandalized and, and so forth. So, you know, these, these, these have become flashpoints, uh, in the past too. And on the one hand, I think as a historian, I'm, I'm, I'm really, um, I'm glad to see people getting excited about history, but I don't want to see people get, you know, excited in a negative way about history. Um, you know, but but I suspect that that will be um, a monument that will be moving uh, in particular. I don't what what is what is the, the actual monument? Is it just a plaque or all I saw was the president had a, a relationship of Emmett Till mm. in Washington and they were talking about they were going to uh, start this monument, and I th I'm not even sure where, but I'm assuming Mississippi. Yeah, uh, and that it, yeah. it was it was honoring the family, right? And, and well, and, and that's the interesting thing about styles, right? In that um, it used to be that uh, so so in Washington, there's always controversies about the the war memorials and war monuments they put there, um, and uh, you know the most famous example of that is the Vietnam War uh, memorial, which at the time a lot of people didn't like. Uh, but then I think as they, as they got used to it and realized what it was doing with the, you guys know what I'm talking about, right? And it's got the, the slope and you can kind of see the, the escalation of the war. The Korean War monument shows uh, its statues. Um, and in fact, we, we are so used to seeing um, monuments being statues of soldiers that actually when they put the Vietnam War monument in, people were so upset they put statues across from it. Um, you know, as kind of a, a conciliation to those folks. The World War II monument has been, I, I think, um, criticized because there aren't statues. It's just, it, 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 it's big, 
uh, and uh, and and it, it doesn't kind of do what it says. The Franklin Delano Roosevelt monument was controversial because there was a question about whether they're going to show him in a wheelchair or not. Um, so you know these these things are always um, fought over, um, but I do think it's interesting that um, that there's a style that was created during this period I'm talking about where a monument is a statue on a pedestal, and we just can't seem to shake that. You know, so I'll be interested to see. I don't know that they're going to put a statue of Emmett Till up, um, but what the design is going to be. Yeah, I wanted to address uh, the efforts of societies to uh, move towards reconciliation and how that's reflected in, in their monuments. Uh, there seem to be in, in recent days lots of truth and reconciliation uh, efforts uh, that um, find ways to uh, uh, to um, uh, move towards forgiveness uh, of, of one side over the other um, and is commemorated. I, I was in West Africa when they uh, uh, in, when they ended a war in in northern Mali by publicly burning all of the weapons that were uh, confiscated from the the the, uh, the various groups, uh, they called it the flame of peace. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, it was a very symbolic effort. But it seems to me that that uh, there must be a historic cycle where um, it, it takes a while for to bring people together after a, a war uh, has taken place, where they can actually sort of uh, lay down their m their memories of of uh, the, the, the weapons that they keep internally. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I'm just wondering if you saw that in any way in the Civil War. Oh, yeah. Um, I think that uh, the whole period, although it was the period of this kind of lost cause mythology, but I think that, that many veterans groups, the whole uh, Gettysburg reunion and so forth, that was all about reconciliation and kind of putting, putting those past conflicts behind. But the group that was left out were African Americans, um, and that's you know David Blight has an amazing book called Racing Reunion that talks explicitly about that, and he has a big section on Decoration Day and how um, how that changed uh, relatively quickly, and so the kind of price that um, that was that was paid for reconciliation between white and uh, Southerners and white Northerners was a kind of exclusion of African Americans from that that kind of memory landscape, um, and we're only now starting to kind of recover that. Um, but, you know, I mean, it's interesting in terms of the, the animosity, one of the most moving, uh, really moving uh, war memorials I've ever seen um, is, is the USS Arizona. Um, and uh, the idea, and, and, and again, it's the, it's, it's the weird things that, that happen that they didn't necessarily mean to happen, but the idea that there's still oil dripping up, if you go, you can still see there's little beads of oil that are dripping up from the Arizona. It's still a uh, active grave site, so there will be sailors around that will tell you to kind of calm down and not, you know, show proper respect. But what I found really fascinating was that there were uh, a number of, of Japanese tourists uh, visiting there. And, you know, there were, there were, there were no harsh glances or anything like that. I mean, it's, it's, it's been a long time. Um, but, you know, and, and, and I've never been uh, to Japan, but I've heard that the uh, Hiroshima Memorial is, is, is quite moving. And, and I suspect that, that Americans uh, can visit it. Um, so, I mean, I do have hope that, you know, that these monuments uh, can play a kind of healing role. I think that unfortunately, the, the kind of monument that was put in place in the American South from the 1890s uh, through the 1920s, uh, were not necessarily uh, meant to show reconciliation to a certain percent pot, per, uh, part of the population that is the African American, it was meant to show dominance over them. And so that's why I think those monuments have become such flashpoints um, and, 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 and why they've been uh, so controversial lately. But, you know, I mean, but, but I've gotten into arguments, you know, again, I, I'm, I'm torn on this. I've gotten into very, very animated arguments with people who have, have said that all the military parks should come down, that you know, we should tear down all these monuments, uh, you know, to Confederate um, soldiers and Confederate generals, and uh, they shouldn't have a, a, a marker uh, for uh, Lee and Jackson, and you know, I, I don't, I don't necessarily subscribe to that at the national battlefield. I mean, I, I understand uh, 
in public places. I understand in courthouses, things like that. I understand that like, you know, that, that might not be appropriate, but I do, I do like the idea of a national military park to, to kind of commemorate the sacrifices that were made there. But as hopefully I've shown you, we have to be careful about how we, we remember those. Well, thank you so much for a really intriguing and thought provoking yeah. presentation. It, it's my book. Thank <laughs> you.